Thank you for staying with me until today. This is, at least for now, and officially the last lesson in uh, WordPress, this introductory course where we actually we haven't really talked anything about code. But it, I'm a bit impressed about myself that we've had a course about WordPress and haven't talked a single word about code. Talked with one of my colleagues from uh, multimedia department and he was like, what's the fun in that? Talking about web websites without code, without talking about code and coding stuff, but yeah. Today the plan is we'll talk a bit, talk briefly about security, then a bit about moving your website from one host to another. For example, you could say from your local computer to whatever online host you chose or from one online host to another. There's luckily some plugins for that so you don't need to use more complicated systems for that. And then in the end we'll talk a slight bit about, well, there's a myriad of web hosts out there. A lot of them good, a lot, uh, a lot of them good, some even more mediocre and some even outright, well, not very good. I'm not going to mention the latter part, but I'm going to mention some of the big play some of the big players in the Danish area and probably some of the ones you might have already know. And then if there's time left, well and then it's time for questions of course. So and I do hope that in the end we'll also have a have a bit of time to for feedback and such. And just as usual, the lesson for last time can be seen online. You should have, you should have gotten the link so on front or your email or, well, yeah, should have gotten the link so you can see the course. Again, the last lesson. I'm going to do the same with the fifth lesson. And well, feel free to share it with uh, with uh, other people and get it or let what go around. But we'll talk a slight bit about that in the end when it comes to hopefully some feedback from you. But the first theme, first first uh, thing today, and actually, given some of the thing, some of the, well, what I've spent most of the last two days uh, trying to fix for, uh, well, I won't mention what, but a school project between yeah, several of the academies in Denmark and, well, quite a few schools where we ended up having quite a few problems without, with namely security, so let's talk a bit about security. So that seems to be a fitting theme for today. Well, I think everybody agrees they want their website to be secure because they don't want, they, I don't think anyone wants their website to be hacked. Or well, actually that's not totally true at all. I know some of my colleagues actually make websites that are supposed to be hacked by the students in the on some of the education here, for basically, so the students can learn what to how to secure their websites. So that's some of the fun things that some of the IT educations do. But you don't want your website to be hacked. That's for sure. At least I hope. Otherwise, you'll be a bit strange. But why do people actually want to hack websites? Let's just talk briefly about that. Well, one thing and. I think this myth, partly myth, was made was is due to late eighties, early nineties movies such as war, such as war games and hackers and such, and they portray that some people like to hack because they find it fun. That's also what, well, very well known people such as Kevin Mitnick said. They they basically said they did it for, because they thought it was fun. Do Google him if you want. Kevin Bitnick, that's Kevin Bitnick. That's an, he had a rather interesting uh, career in the, yeah, Ella, whatever you should call it, in the late 90s, late 80s, around early 90s. One of the most prolific hackers ever. We can discuss he, well, how good he was, but he did at least make a stir up quite a few things. There's a myth about the yeah, ethical hacker who likes, who wants to hack websites to tell the the owner that, well, the website is broken, do secure it before someone bad comes by. I don't say that they exist. Part of the, a lot, a big part of this myth is also, uh, well, about the legend about anonymous, you could say. 
personally, I don't really uh, I don't re agree much on that. I don't think that the the re uh, that people well, maybe a few people do it because they find it fun and it's an interesting thrill and so on. But there's nothing ethical about basically breaking into someone else's stuff. It would be the same as a as a burglar bre breaking into a house and saying he's doing it to, for fun and showing the owner that his windows were weak. It's basically the same. So let's bur uh, bury that myth. People do it because they get something out of it. And probably not just the trail of it. People, one thing, you've probably seen quite a few websites being defaced, mainly, partly, been mentioned a few times in the even in the Danish media that anonymous hacked websites belonging to ISIS and others. That's rather not. There are very few to, uh, examples of that. The, the other way around is actually a lot more common. Luckily, they are taken down, but they actually ISIS and other Islamic or Islamic ter terrorist organizations. Well, not only Islamic but terrorist organizations. In, in general, the keyword here is is well. P uh, organization wanting to spread the word about some usually unpopular cause. They hack webs. They do tend to hack websites and do what they call what's called defacing them. Simply changing the content of the websites to say per, yeah, to show a message of their choice. Uh, one of them I've seen personally myself several times. Luckily not on my sites, but on stuff done for companies. Was uh, for example the Kurds in. Uh, Turkey, they do it quite a f quite a bit actually. The people who want freedom f uh, freedom for the Kurds in Turkey, they for some odd reason they think they would get the message called across if they hack websites and uh, have them proclaim pro uh, pro proclaim uh, freedom for the oppressed in Turkey. Same goes for Palest Palestine. There's lots of groups in Palestine for some uh, hacking websites and uh, to spread spread the word word about Palestine being suppressed. I don't really get those people. Why they? Why do they hack websites to get? Otherwise, you can. Uh, dis uh, we, I'm uh, not going in getting into the politics about their causes being just, but it's not just destroying people's stuff just to get your message across. But yet, there are, there are people and organizations who do that. That's one reason because people want to spread a message for some word. And to be honest, would you, by choice, go to a website? Uh, Claim uh, praising the word of Allah in, uh, uh, from ISIS. No, that's why they. Uh, that's I suppose that's why they are hacking websites to get their word to get, to get their word out in the hope of capturing someone's imagination and having them join the cause. Well, yeah, there's fanatics everywhere, but that's one reason for people hacking. Another. And that's a pretty big one, especially if you have webshops. If you're running your webshops, you ought to do especially much about security because you have people's user information. Other people, they want that. Even if you don't, even if you have a third party payment option, which most shops use nowadays, and so you don't store credit card numbers on your, web, on your own website, people still want access to your website to get pe as much information about other people as possible. Luckily, it's they are, well, barring the use of uh, the CPR number for a lot of uses, but let's say you actually, the more, even if you have, basically in, in a lot of countries, if you have people's name, and especially if you have both the name and the CPR number, then you can go out and take a loan. So if people are able to harvest websites for information about whatever customers you have or whatever users your website has, they have another piece of the puzzle in building up a fake persona so they can go out and lend or, and borrow money in that person's name. So basically, one of the big reasons for people hacking websites is to get as much information about the users as possible. Maybe you won't even see that they have, that they actually are collecting that data. I mean, a lot of people hack websites and then just leave small bits in the code that track whatever users do on the website. In that regard, actually, if your website had been hacked and they've left some tracking device on your website, it would even be able to, to uh, get people's credit card numbers if you're unlucky, if they leave some trace running in the memory of the 
of the user visiting your website and then going on to pay at the bank. So that's a big one. And of course, monetary loss for you. I mean, I know it sounds crazy and it's very it's highly illegal. But imagine what if a what, what if a key com what if the website of a key competitor was hacked and went down for a week, for example around Black Friday, where there's obviously an extreme amount of stuff being sold online. Imagine that your key competitor's website went down in that week. Wouldn't that be good for you? I know it's a bit, it's basically the same as corporate espionage, but it does happen. Luckily, it's not big here. I, at least I prefer to think it's not big here in Denmark. People do that, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't count it out in other more volatile markets where people don't have as high a, or high an ethical standard as here in Denmark. Well, that's also a bit. At least we hope is we have a high ethical, ethical standard here in Denmark, and where the police don't really take such matters that serious. But yeah, that could happen. So that will last for you. And let's see what other ones. What would you? Yeah, an authorized, unauthorized code execution. I think we've covered the main things. Actually, an interesting thing. I'm going to link to those articles too. An interesting thing about when I mentioned defacing and people wanting some uh, other people's websites to go down. I had some. I worked. I did some work for uh, for a Danish web bureau, and one of their websites that was constantly under attack. That people tried to hack or was basically under attack, twenty four seven. That was constantly people constantly tried to get down. That was, for some odd reason, a Christian free church near Espia. But people really wanted that Christian church to go down. They didn't want that Christian church to exist on the net. I don't know why. Maybe because it was Christian. Maybe someone had a grudge behind, uh, against the owner. I mean, that also happens. People wanting to hack websites and wanting them to go down because of grudges. I said corporate. Okay, I said corporation and corporate espionage. That's the big one. But personally, you could have pissed some. It's entirely possible that a person pisses someone off so much that he wants to, that that person wants to destroy the other person's. Well, it's a, if, it, if it's a shop, maybe livelihood, or at least uh, destroy the other person's work. Or because he wants to destroy, or in that case of the Christian church, probably because of he doesn't want, he wants to destroy the, yeah, maybe a re religion he or she doesn't like. Who knows? And it's certainly easy to get tools and get, get tools and get started at hacking. Luckily, most of those tools and people just starting out aren't very good, so they are easier to block, but... It is it is sadly easy to get started and trying to get other people's websites down. So there's a lot of ways and reasons for people to maybe not a lot, but there are ways there are reasons for people to try and hack websites. So that's what we want to prevent. And luckily you can do a lot yourself. You can also do a lot even as a non professional web developer. And some of them are even extremely easy. You just need to remember and stay on your stay alert. The main thing that I can, that is getting hacked nowadays. That's plugins and themes. You might have noticed when you go to the, for example, go to the WordPress uh, market and WordPress. Yeah, you know, if you go here, for example, and search for plugins. You might have noticed. Let's click on a plugin. Let's just say BB Press. It says last updated. When you install plugins, it might be just what you need. But if it was, it wasn't. If but, with, but a, you might get a few problems because maybe it doesn't fit the current version. That's 4.9.1. Probably DB Press it will work with 4.9.1, but at least it says test it up to. So that's the first thing. Of course, the plugin might not work properly. And the other thing is you can see updated two months ago. 
if you want to use a plugin that's been not been updated for a long time well one thing is that plugin has been out there in the wild for quite a while people have uh, people have had a long time to try and f f uh, to find all the vulnerabilities in the plugin if there are any vulnerabilities they can use to to uh, get a backdoor on hacker website if it's been out there for a long time without being updated chances are it is all the world uh, uh, chances are all the vulnerabilities of the plugin would be known. So in general, if you were working, if, if you're installing a plugin, check it. Has it been un, uh, has it been updated at least somewhat recently? If it's not been updated quite a long time ago, I can't. Uh, I don't say that it's necessarily bad or insecure, but you need to be alert. And maybe if it's not been updated for a long time. Maybe try and talk to a friend or someone who knows a bit more about web development. Ask him to, to uh, assess, would it be a good idea to install this or not, if you choose something rather ancient, because it might have be just what you need, but not updated for a long while. So one of the first things, and rather important one, when, yeah, when dealing with security is, Keep your plugins. Same goes, by the way, for themes. It's just what I said about plugins being updated. Exactly the same goes for themes. Not that much difference. Keep them updated. Keep them as much updated as possible. In general, keep all the code of your website as new as possible. The same goes, especially for WordPress. The same goes for WordPress core. Luckily, it's built in a way nowadays that it's rather secure. When I'm talking about WordPress core, I'm talking about WordPress itself. Keep that updated too. And general, update, update, update. Keep all stuff on your website, all code on your website as updated as possible. Luckily, that's extremely easy as you, as you just go to the dashboard. Updates just under home. And then you can see, aha. Uh -huh. And then your website, and then, then your WordPress automatically checks at least against the ones in the official WordPress.org repository. Is the WordPress up to date? Yes, it is. Your plugins are up to date. Your themes are up to date. And if you use translations, for example, if your website is Danish, I mean, most themes and all that stuff are made, is made in English, but a lot of them are of multiple languages or, like I showed you last time, if you have some plugins that allow you to translate stuff yourself, then it auto checks, are your translation up to date? With what it can see officially exists. If you if you if you made a translation yourself, of course it can't check against the official ones because there are no official ones. But it checks. Is it up to date? Your website doesn't take many seconds. The good thing is, if something is not up to date, then there would even be in then it, then as you noticed, the updates here was not visible right from right from the get go. If there's updates, there would be a round red. Usually, to use the default color theme of that link, there will be a round red dot next update with the number of updates of, of things that needs to be updated. There are even a lot of the security plugins, which I'll get to in a moment. They can even help you also update all your plugins and themes for you, so you don't even need to do it. And or they can, and or they can send you an email if there are updates from some of the stuff you use on your website. So really, really there. Is, isn't really any work in keeping the WordPress, keep keeping your plugins and WordPress up to date, and that's the main thing to uh, main thing and first thing to do when secu when uh, wanting to secure your, to, to secure your WordPress, keep it up to date. Yeah. But I bought some. But if you, but but then you think, but I bought a theme from Theme Forest or somewhere else, and not I'm not using one of the ones in the re repository. Well, sadly, if you have a Third party, so third party premium theme like the ones with Theme Pro Forest, they do not necessarily work with this with this update function. You can't check if they they are up to date usually. Luckily, if you buy a theme from from Theme Forest, you'll get an email whenever the theme developer updates it. So you just need to check your email if you have a theme developed by someone someone else. Good chances are you'll then get an email if there's an update for the theme. So, I think that was 
the main thing updating yeah another thing you might have heard the, the, the term brute force attacks when talking about websites usually it's not people but a bot it's basically whenever you try to put it very simple for example when you try to log in it's your website says the password if you if, you, if you, the password is incorrect if you don't use a name otherwise it was this but then it, the password is incorrect then you can try another password and another password yeah well we agree at least if you pro hopefully use secure passwords we'll get to those in a moment it will take a little while to guess the password but if you try enough times you should be able to guess any password i mean it's simple probability do the math if you have if you have let's say four letters let's let's just discount special signs and if you just say letters four well that's 25 times 25 times four Then if you have a 10 password, 10, 10, uh, 10, uh, le 10 uh, later password, it would be more and so on. If, of course, longer passwords is more secure, but even if they're long, given enough time, given enough tries, given enough brute force, people would get a, a, yeah, a bot, a script, a bot attacking your website, will guess it eventually. That's called brute force attacks. Luckily, we can also defend up against those and they mean and thus use a secure may use a somewhat secure password because otherwise even there are some things that are rather easy and patterns there are you people usually use like people like they're saying here this password pa55 word that's pretty common and i love justin well if people know it's a young girl writing having a website that's also one of the good ones to try. Do find some a bit, a bit more, because scripts ask, uh, people know what passwords you, uh, are often used. And so they try those first before they begin uh, hammering away. It's still the same script doing everything to you, though. And yes, even last, uh, even last year, used, there's usually there's some organizations doing it a year and so we usually each year to find the most used passwords. Even last year, uh, last year was a bit better. I think 2016, the most commonly used password was 1234567 2015 and before was only 1234567. So at least they added 78 now. But yeah, do try to find some passwords. And because the bots do try the most obvious ones first. But that's brute force, basically people trying to hammer for example, a login form to try and get onto your website. You can block that. We'll get to that in a moment. And of course, people for some can try to hack your web host, but will not get into that because that's a whole other level of talk about security. Because then you need to talk with in because then you actually need to know a bit about server setup and don't have a deeper knowledge of your web host. Yep. Yeah, and. We'll get to. Don't think I'll go much into exactly on how to do a lot of stuff. Had a bit of a talk with my colleague, and we agreed that to, to get a bit deeper into security, we need to talk a bit more about code. So I know you aren't coders, so I'll skip to the main plugins and touch briefly on uh, to some plugins who does mainly pretty much all the work for you, at least most of the work for you, and only touch briefly upon exactly what work they're doing. Yeah. Actually, there's WordFence. We're going to get to that plugin later on. It's a company making a security plugin for WordPress. They are actually making a monthly report on attacks on WordPresses. So... Ah, last month actually okay. It's not that many thousand IPs blocked every day. But yeah, 
they actually keep ranks. You can see this. You can even follow the security standards, the security status, and so on. Actually, there's a lot of themes attacked. The interesting thing here, you can actually see which themes are the most attacked ones. Doesn't mean that people got through, but they are attacked. So that's of course another option. Again, if you're using something not that common, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Of course, if you're using very uh, use some very obscure theme, the chances are not a lot of people have tried hacking it because, well, it's basically the same way as uh, Mac having quite a lot less virus allowed. At least uh, until, you know, until re recently, but at least Macs having quite a less uh, uh, Macs having quite a lot less viruses than Windows. It doesn't mean that there, there aren't viruses for Macs. There are actually quite a few, but nowhere near as many uh, for Windows because let's face it, face it, Mac only has five to ten percent of the market market share, depending on where in the world you are, whereas Windows sits at around ninety percent. Obviously, it's a lot more market. It's a lot more. It's, it's a lot more, well, it's good business practice to target win to mainly target Windows if you're a virus developer, virus developer instead of Macs because there are a lot more Windows machines, there's a lot more targets. Same goes for the popular themes for WordPress. Like, let's say, you can see, even the ones that came 2015, that's one of the ones that came with work, where it came, comes with WordPress automatically, or 2017. You can see the ones named after ES, that's, well, they come with WordPress automatically. They were still some of the most popular ones because, well, p most people have them installed. So to, even due to sheer virtue of being installed a lot, they are very much targeted. So take this list with a grain of salt because just because something's obscure doesn't mean that it's secure. Of course, there's a less chance of people having found all the vulnerabilities in it, but then again, there's less chance of uh, people having patched it because they haven't simply been found yet. So. Like I said, Obscurus is a bit of a double-edged sword. Just look at Windows and Mac. And here they also have a list of plugins. I'm going to put this online so you can see it along with the video for today. But it's interesting if you find, uh, yeah, security interesting. Oh, and uh, probably don't, uh, okay, maybe the second one surprises you a bit, but where actually most attacks come from? Russia is number one. And China's number three. It shouldn't surprise you. Might be a surprise that the uh, United States is number two. But I'm betting that not is that goes for actually for all countries. Not all of the numbers of people who want to hack websites. Probably a lot of them are um, the attacks come from as the machines infested with viruses, which are then using the, those zombie machines to attack websites. AK buttons. So you can read a lot about on security and there is the whole field of security specialists and they do earn a lot of money. I'm actually not so, uh, they are among some of the more higher paid IT professional security guys. Just but that just that doesn't mean if you're a company you should skip on hiring an uh, security specialist to uh, look through your website and generally your IT system they are worth their money because the risk of losing a lot losing money is a lot higher than, if, than uh, having to pay to get make sure that it's up to date so i've touched a bit upon how people hack websites the main the two main area the main way they hack either find a secure plugin that for some in some way gives a plugin team or something that gives them access to the site or they just try to get brute force access, mainly through the plugin form. Well, what can you do that, do to change that? Do to prevent uh, your website from getting hacked? Like I mentioned quite a few times, change the default admin username. Do not call your administrative user admin, because if the, one thing is the, let's say there's someone, someone wanting to brute for uh, attacking a website with brute force. They both need the they after all they both need the username and the password. So if the username is rather obscure, they both first need to guess the username, and then they need to guess the password. So do use some username that's not that obvious. 
That means if, let's say you're called, you're called uh, let's say your name is Julia and you're posting, web, posting stuff on your website under the name of Julia. Don't have the same username as the name or username that's very similar to the name you post as. Again, it's very easy to guess. You don't even need to be a robot to get to uh, do anything there. I mean, a person looking at, at uh, let's say you post uh, the post are made by someone called Julia Peterson. Then the first thing to guess, okay, admin doesn't work. Let's try Julia. That's a bad idea. Find something a little bit more imaginative. Especially the same goes for same goes for password when you get to those. So change the admin username. Make a secure password. And fits now. How do you create a secure password? Well, one a secure password is one that's not easy to guess. If you ask WordPress to get to generate a password, it does usually generate what is. It does generate a, a strong password. You've probably seen if you go into your admin panel and, or the password they suggest you in the start, at the start when you installed it. Yeah, those are secure. I mean, exclamation mark five, something, something letters, something 10 different letters and, uh, and signs mixed together with a combination of small and large letters. Yeah, that's hard to hack because people, it's hard to find a pattern in that. The problem is, you have to be a bit of autistic to remember such passwords, I'd say. No, to, no offense to people with autism, but normal people can't remember such random, com random combinations of letters and signs. Well, what should you then do? One of them, one of the good ones is maybe a password that is well, at least somewhat easier to use. What's easier to use? Well, you could of course say, well, my mother's name, would that be secure using your mother's name as part of a password? Because I hope most of you remember the name of your mother, your mother at least. If not, I feel sorry for you. But. Would that be secure? For example, mo uh, your mother's name and then her birth date. Would that be a secure password? I hope. Yes, at least there's one shaking her head. I'm happy. Yes, that wouldn't be a secure password because if A is very easy to find out, uh, let's say maybe for a body it would take a little bit of time to break, but let's say there's some person who wants to get into your website, a real person. It's rather easy to Google. You have a website, then people can find your name in a, in a couple of seconds. When people have your name, it's very easy to find your mother's name. If they have your mother's name, it's probably very easy to find a birth date somewhere online too, especially in these days of Facebook and social media. I think especially goes for your children's name if you have children. Do not ever use your children's name as a main part of the password, because that's the first thing people check when you want to break a password. Okay, then what about my pets? I mean, I love my pets. They, I, I would never forget the name of my pet. Same goes for pets. There's a good chance that you somewhere online have written about Mr. Fluffle Bunny that you love so much. So again, pet, pet, pet names isn't really a good part of a security strategy either. Okay, how, do you, how should you remember it then? A good way to make a password might then be mix, uh, maybe sentences that you can remember. So let's say you do love your rabbit very much, and you want to you want to and you want to make that part of your password. Then maybe let's say it's called Mr. Fluffle Bunny. So Mr. M F and it was spawn M F B. Maybe M Big M because it's Mr. and Big F because it's Fluffle Bunny B. Let's say it was born 2016, MFB 2016, exclamation mark because that's an important date. And oh, what should we put after it? Something else. 
creates thirdly a lot and it's a bit longer. But make a sentence that you can use and then inside that sentence have some letters be big and some letters be small. And then of course add some random, like I said, an exclamation mark or underscore or some special signs somewhere dispersed in between that sentence. That's a good way of at least making a password that you have a chart and have a chance of remembering. Make a past sentence instead of a password and then you know when you remember the past sentence, okay, maybe the first letter of each word or maybe the middle letter of each word, the last letter of each word or some, try to have some pattern that you remember along with the, part, with the sentence. That's a lot, at least easier to, you, to, re to remember some sentence that has some kind of meaning to you instead of having to remember a total random conglomeration of letters, numbers and, and signs. That's a good strategy at least, making a past sentence and then some way of using some key signs from that past sentence. And yeah, the classic is 12 characters, numbers, symbols, capital letters, lowercase letters, isn't a dictionary words and combination of dictionary words, that's also a bit obvious. I mean, if you like waffles, then th that's what, if you like waffles, people would know that, and that would also be one of the first things to check if you thought it was waffles. And, and don't rely on ob obvious to substitution. For example, oh, I'm sneaky. I'm writing, writing waff waffles with a four instead of an A because the four, letter four looks like an A. That's too obvious, I'm sorry. A past sentence is actually the best, one of the best suggestions, uh, e easy to use suggestions I have. And people do, do agree. And that's why I put this up too. Another way, at least if you, if you decide to stick with those very yeah, random passwords, which are good, at least from a security standpoint, is to use, have a program on your computer that can remember them for you. Probably, you also noticed Chrome, Firefox, pretty much all the browsers ask, do you want me to, do you want me to remember the password for you? What would be the most security conscious thing to be uh, be when your browser asks to remember your password? Should, would you just say yes? No. Then again, you can't remember every password in... It's a good idea to have a unique password on, on each website you have and we, we each website you use. Oh, hand on your heart. How many of you use the same password on more than one website? Exactly, yeah. I know. I'm do the same, I must admit. But let's say you're using a, trying to have unique passwords on each website. You can use a lot of password generators, for example, or have them suggest your passwords. That's nice, the websites. And the same goes for your WordPress. But how do you remember them then? Actually, the, it hurts a bit to see it, but the idea of, at least, especially for, at least Firefox nowadays, actually ask for your master password before uh, remembering passwords. So at least then you only have to remember the master password for your Firefox on your only one single computer. So that's a bit more, a bit secure because then you can have two dozen different passwords for the websites you use, but you at least only have to remember the website for your browser at first. That's one thing to do it. And then there's specified software. So for example, Keybus, that's open source and free. But that actually, that's, the whole point of software such as that, most actually, quite uh, quite some cell phones come with uh, software with similar software from the get you go, so you can use it for mobile phone as a as a safe for your passwords. The point of that software, uh, no matter if you're on your mobile phone or if you're running it on your computer, is you can save your passwords there. For example, say keep us at a website, and then you write the write the address of the website, and then your password for that website inside that that program. The reason that is secure is because keepers and also the ones for mobile phones, they use very high encryption levels. So if you know, have a, at least one reasonably sure secure password for your website, for your either your program or maybe on your mobile phone, you may probably, your mobile phone probably has some kind of biometric uh, pass option too, either fingerprint or iris scan or similar. Those are rather hard to duplicate after all. 
So then you can have basically a safe where you have saved all your unique passwords for your websites. That's also a good strategy because those who offer those services, they know they need to be, well, hard to get, so they are usually encrypted very hard. I, rem I think if I remember the encryption Samsung uses on the one they have on their phones, for example, the option the the one they have, I think it should would take, well, a normal computer should take, uh, I think it was 100, 100, 150 years currently to break the password for the encryption, they, to break the encryption used for some of those apps. Of course, if you have a lot of computers, so it takes a shorter while, but the fact is, it takes a long time to, those, those soft, those uh, digital, digital safers for passwords, they are engineered in that, in such a way that it will take a long time. So do, re do, if you have a lot of websites and manage very sensitive stuff, that might be a way to help you remembering your password, having a vault somewhere on a safe device where you can then access with that one key, one code, then to gain access to all your others. People, uh, those of you using Macs, you already have that option built in uh, into OS X actually. OS X has one place, one place where it's saving all your passwords. I can show you how to get access to that. Then you just, then you need that. But to get access to that on a Mac, you do need to have admin user on the Mac. So that also takes basically the same thing. That was a bit about the admin use and passwords. Yep. Disable editing and PHP file execution. Most of the plugins do that. Limit login attempts. That's another simple, th very simple thing and a very good way your web host will, will usually love if you do that because, like I said, bots are trying to brute force their way onto your website. Well, how to prevent that? They will just keep trying and trying and trying new password combinations and usernames to get in. Well, the easiest way to do it, and luckily that comes built in, in even in Jetpack and, mo and especially most very most uh, security plugins, they limit the, the number of plugin attempts. Maybe then you know that from your you pro you know the same from uh, many computers. Let's say you try you can set the number so you can maybe try to log into your website ten times. And then if you if you haven't uh, gotten the right info ten times, ten times isn't that it isn't much. If it's about it, will say probably try to log in, well, still uh, maybe a thousand times a second with a new password each time. So limit login attempts. Let's say you let the you you generous and then you use it to try ten times to enter the right password because you know some of the users remember have a bad memory. Many places only allow users to try three times, for example. But let's say you use ten. Then if they try, try more than 10 times they play and they don't enter the correct password and, and uh, yeah, but if, they, if they don't remember, uh, if they don't enter the right password 10 times, then they might get blocked for half an hour. Good. Then they might try again in half an hour. And if they then enter 10 times, most of those options here would then block them for three hours, for example. And then after three hours, if they try again and don't get in, if they don't enter the right password, they would probably be blocked for a day. That's a good idea. Limit login attempts combined with some way of uh, blocking for a certain period of time. You can even get that to work together with the server. Yeah. WordPress database prefix. Yeah. I think that's. You can read up on the last. Bit yourself. Another good thing to consider, at least, especially if you have some site, come, if especially have a shop where people make users and so on, incorporate some kind of two factor authentication. Well, they you need the username, password, and then maybe you can actually get services. Where, you, uh, when the, where your website then contacts some third party writer and sends out an SMS with a code. You know that from Google probably. Google has uh, two factor two factor authentication that way. Many computer games use the same. This is in Steam, for example. They have that option too. So uh, to log in from a new computer each time you need uh, each time you try to log into the website from a new computer, you need to have you get some code sent 
maybe either by e and, and unique code sent by email or by SMS in some way. So you have to enter your username, your password, and a unique code generated at the time of login to be, to be able to get access. That's basically a two-factor authentication. You both have to, f first factor would be the lock would be the password, and second factor would then be, yeah, whatever extra security measure you use. A bit similar as another kind of two-factor is, I know, I don't know anyone who loves captures. I think we all hate them. Those strange pixelated images where there's some word that's somehow smudged a bit so it, you can read it, but the point is a computer, a computer program wouldn't be able to scan the image and read the, read the, read the letters right away. Captures are also a good way of having a kind of two-factor authentication. You have to write the correct word of the capture. Or maybe some plugins allow users to have have the have will have the user at and will have the user solve small math problems. For example, let's say it's two plus four. Very important, those are probably written as images, not as text. And then you have the user have to write A or similar. That's also a good way of having another security factor before people are allowed to log in. The sad thing about captures is they're easy to break. I mean, the computer can't read them. No. But last time I checked it, it uh, last time I checked it, paid, I think it was half a cent per capture you had in India. If you hired a, hired Indian, hired a, hired a company specializing in that in India to break them. So, yeah, they're more secure, but people are paying other people to, yeah, write them for them. But another layer, it's always good. Yeah. I mentioned that a slide bit when you talk about SEO, HTTPS. Do remember to get your website to use a secure connection, especially if you have any kind of content. And if you have any kind of, uh, well, shop or somewhere where people can pay. Actually, it's pretty much mandatory if you use that. HTTPS just means you have a secure connection. Your web host has probably somewhere in the admin time where you can uh, tick a box and then get HTTPS. Uh, maybe you might have to pay for it, but it is definitely worth it because that basically encrypts the connection between the user and the browser. Again, it's a bit then other pe then it's a bit harder to hijack connections and so on. Yeah, and some obvious things to secure your website. You might have tried 35 different themes on your website before you found the right one. Cool. I mean, do that. Try it out. Try it, try it out. There's a lot of free stuff out there, or even paid stuff if you want. There's a lot of stuff out there. Try to find the one that suits you the best. But, like I said, people try to hack themes and especially plugins. Use those to get access to websites. So, a good thing if you try 35 themes. May believe, let's say 2017, so we have fallback theme if something in your main theme gets cor corrupt, that's always a good idea. And then delete all the other 33. Because less themes, less, less things to hack, less ways into your website. And same especially goes for plugins. So if you don't use, if you have themes and plugins and you know you don't use them, or not at least. Okay, maybe you use them month and month because there's some um, security backup plugin you just activate once more. That might be okay, but if generally if you have some plugins and themes you don't use, you have the you have them disabled on your website, delete them. There's less code to try and hack to get access. But of course. Yeah. And this one should hopefully be a no, be a no brainer. Never download premium plugins for free. You know, premium is the stuff you pay for, Team Forest or somewhere else. And if you know, then find some website that says premium themes are free. Chances are, they aren't free. People may have people might have uh, either bought it to the first or in some way connected to the theme, and then they added some code in, and then they probably opened the theme and edited the code. So it would basically be the same when you're installing a free premium theme. There's a good chance that the pre-theme comes right from the get-go, hacked already, so people can take control of your website. 
right when you install the free premium theme that you got from a dubious website. Same would be, ah, I don't want to try, I don't want to pay 50, fifty dollars to get access to that nice theme from uh, Theme Forest. That's a lot of money, actually. It's not people. When you consider fifty dollar, fifty dollar ain't that much. And people usually good things tend take hundreds, if not take several, takes many hundreds of hours to develop. So fifty dollar really ain't that much. But let's say you don't want to pay it, then you just search free, uh, and then the theme that you want. Yeah, there's a good chance you might find it. There's a lot of websites out there hosting hacked themes. Most of those hacked themes, hacked themes that normally cost money, come with small surprises. Don't take the risk, especially not if you're, if you're using the website for something professional. So don't trust anything they're saying. Free premium usually, usually comes with a back door, and you don't want back doors onto your website. So just don't do it. Photo representation. I mentioned that already. Yeah. Like I said, there's a lot of plugins making security for WordPress easier. Some are, uh, some of them are better than others. Some of them are more useful useful than others. Sukuri is one of the big ones. I'm going to mention a few of the security plugins that are worth it. In my and uh, many other people's opinion, Sukuri is one of the big ones, one of the old security services. They actually also have a lot, they also have also have a nice uh, service online where you can check where you can have them check your website. Has it been hacked? Is it easy to hack and so on? And some of the online services are even free. The plugin is also free. At least some of the basic options. You can get a few more advanced options if you pay. So security is so Sukuri is one of the good is one of the great ones. I think security pro I think security and then then if you pay for it you get the pro version. Big surprise there. The normal I think security just search for it in there. It's also very good security. It does a lot of stuff. Basically you just have to click one button and then it does a lot of the more advanced stuff for you. So you don't really have to think about anything files and setting security limits on files on your server and so on. That plugin does it, that plugin does it for you. The nice thing, in my opinion, about the pro thing, pro version two, doesn't work with all web hosts, but it work, works for a lot of people, it works many places, is that if you have, let's say you have 10 websites, then you buy 10 user license for this plugin, then you just like into a control panel on their website, then you can security update all your 10 web pages let's say update plugins and do all the security maintenance stuff on all 10 web pages from one place. That's pretty nice added feature if you have around several websites. So I think security is also a great one. One a main point of those are cost, brute force protection, like I mentioned, all of the security plugins, you have that. File change the section, same goes if there's, if it basically monitors if there's uh, been some changes to some of the files on your website. Then you get an email, who that file has been edited. Are you sure that's there? Is, is so then you need, of course that might be a bit annoying. You're getting spammed with emails for, for when, people, when files are changed on your website. On the other hand, then you know files are changed, then you can judge is that change is uh, because, yeah, it's annoying when you set change files yourself, but maybe if someone else does it, it's rather nice to get an email saying, hey, this has been changed, and then you know, okay, this is not me. Then you know that you need to do something. And, yeah, it has a lot of options. So I think security is also a very good security plugin with some uh, interesting features with uh, syncing and stuff to prepare across websites. They also, part of their deal and what they're making is also a very good backup, backup plugin called Backup Buddy, which we'll get back to in a moment. Same company, I think. WordFence. That's also very nice. Also free. All of those I'm mentioning exist in free versions, and then you can pay to get a few more premium features. WordFence is another security plugin. Basically, what I said. One of the good things about that is you get a 
in when you look on, you can see it, you get a screen where you can see basically where people are trying to, yeah, trying to hack your website come from. And then you see small, a list of small, uh, yeah, country flags, and then where people come from. That's actually WordPress installation trying to prevent people from getting hacked. Looks kind of nice. Yeah. Bulletproof security is also one of the older ones, not as popular nowadays, but it's still a good one. Again, very easy to use. You basically click with one or two buttons, and it does most of the setup for you. For you, so that's also recommended. But then. Why not have all of those security plugins installed on your website? Wouldn't that be extra good? Well, how many of you run more than one antivirus program on your computer? Why don't you do that? They take up resources, resources, and they're basically doing the same. Doing the same. That's the same here. Find the one security plugin you like the most and stick with it. One should be enough because both of all those I mentioned here, they're basically doing more or less the same. There's a slight bit difference between a few of them. I mean, WordFence is doing some things a slight bit better than, for example, I seem. So it might make sense to have those two installed together, for example, because being because uh, WordFence has a very nice uh, geographical tracker of where the attacks come from and so on. But you don't need to have it, have a dozen security plugins installed. One or maybe two would be enough. Because if you look through what they're doing, they are mainly doing the same. Maybe one do it does some things better than the other. Then you might have one installed doing eight things, and then then eight, eight things it does best, and then there's two things it doesn't do that well. Maybe then you would install the other, another security plugin to do those two things because the, if that does those two the best, then you, 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 then uh, disable the rest of the stuff so they don't really get in the way of each other. So you don't need many security plugins, but at least one or maybe two, depending on the your setup and your level what you want to but do install it do re, do at least get one security plugin especially if you don't want to edit and uh, change file permissions and edit some of the server setup files and so on on your i mean most of what those plugins do you can do it yourself you can harden yourself you can harden your website and harden a lot of stuff yourself by editing some key fi key files that communicate with the server you don't need the plugins per se, no. But it sure makes life easier because then you don't need to edit files manually, files edit manually yourself, and do a lot of setup yourself. And those files, they will break your website if you set them up incorrectly. For example, there's a file basically that that that, 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 try, that tells the server which files should people get access to on your website. If you set something wrong there, they won't get access access to your website at all. You can basically say people won't get shouldn't get access to to JPEG images on your website by adding one line in a, in, a, in, a, in a text file. That's what those plugins do for you. They do all those settings for you, so you don't need to change those, those, uh, well, those uh, high security files yourself. If you know what you do, you can edit them yourself, but I do recommend until you read a lot up on it, use those plugins. They do 95% they do of all the work you could do manually for you. So get a security plugin. I think that's I've said that many times now. Good. Then backup. There's a lot of plugins to back up your website. And security and backup, that luckily those two luckily goes hand in hand. Because what do you do if your website gets hacked? Other than weep? Well, maybe you don't need to weep because you made a backup yesterday. Then you just roll the backup onto your website, overriding all the changes the hacker might have done, and then you find the security hole that was on your website yesterday and block it. But at least if you have a backup, you can roll back to an earlier version of your website. So, have some, so having a proper backup strategy for your website is just as important as having a proper backup, just as if not even more important than having a proper backup strategy for your computer. Because your website is obviously accessible from the internet 24-7, so there's a greater chance of someone something happening, yeah, someone getting access to that and doing stuff with that than with your computer. 
So having a proper backup strategy is a good idea. But that's not needed. I have my web host. I can ask them to roll back. Yeah. But when do they make their backups? That's actually a good thing to check in your in your customer agreement with your web host. When do they actually back up your website? Most of the cheap ones actually do back up your, their customer, make a back up of their customer stuff. But usually only once a week. And the most cheap ones, they want money, they want money to restore the backup. So therefore, it might be a good idea to have a plugin or some other service, a plugin, either do manual backup of your website yourself or have a plugin installed to help you do backup. Most of those plugins actually can also schedule backups so they do the backup of your website for you. Then you at least have a backup that you can install yourself and roll back to when you, when you need, if you need for some upgrade. Hopefully you'll never need your backups. I mean, that's the ideal world. You make backups when you don't, you never need them, but you might, you might risk it. So, the good thing about many of those, those on the list and so on, they, they do they do off the option. The most basic thing is they can make a backup, take a backup of your, all your content and uh, database and so on, and put it on a zip file on your web server. That's the basic thing. And then you can download the zip file yourself. Yeah. Most of those plugins actually also offer the option of using, uh, of having off-site backups. Off-site means obviously somewhere else. So maybe they can allow you to set it back, take it back, uh, it takes a ba basically a copy of everything on your website, puts it in usually in a giant zip file, and then uploads it to, for example, Dropbox. Or if you have some other cloud service. That's nice. Of course, then you need to, need, need, then you need to worry about your Dropbox account getting hacked so people get access to the data from your website and then they can use that data from your website which is stored on your Dropbox to get access to your website and so on and so forth. This, of course, adds another layer of risk. I mean, the more places you have stuff stored, the more risk you are. But on the other hand, it's a good place to have it stored somewhere in the cloud so you can always get access to a backup should your website go down. All those plugins mentioned here of that. And plus the backup has one other and one other nice option. If you have a backup on your website, you can take your website and move it to somewhere else. And this, for example, there's plugins specially made with that for the main reason. I mean, most of the backup plugins are just what I said: having a backup so you can restore it in case someone goes something goes wrong or your website is hacked or something. Then you can restore a backup. But there are backup plugins, for example, Duplicator, which main purpose actually is to make a copy of your website. You may basically install Duplicator on the Duplicator plugin on your WordPress site, and then you ask it to archive the yeah, make a backup, and then you get and then, then you download the zip file, and then you install the Duplicator plugin on your new website, and say restore and find the zip file, and then restore your website, basically looking just as it was from the from from your Duplicator backup. That's a good way to use backups too. So you're always secure that you can uh, get back to them. And there are yeah, quite a few good backup plugins. I'm going to put the links here. And Duplicator, that makes migration, moving from one web server to one server to another, very easy. So that's definitely recommended for that use. And it's free. This video is also to use yeah good then the last thing I promised to talk about today was some of the where you can actually store your website so let's say you made your website you made your WordPress site for example on your computer and then you want to bring it out for somewhere for the world to see then you of course need somewhere to store it on the net and you think why can't I just put my change a few settings on my computer and have my computer and then connect my computer to the to the internet and have my computer run the web server, just like uh, you might be running a web server, running a local web server now via member similar. Why can't I just uh, run a web server and then give it access to the world? You can do that, definitely. But then you, then you need to be aware of the security of your server, not only of your website, but actually how does your server one more work? Do you, you need to update your server and keep the, your server secure too? 
Plus, your computer uses electricity. That does, that usually costs money. And if you, if you begin calculating on it, actually, usually, it probably costs a bit more money than you think. Computers are power hogs, even if they are. Plus, you, you can't use, it really would be a stupid idea to use your computer there for something else if you're running a server on it. I mean, you have a nice website, you have a web shop. Oh, I need to play Counter-Strike. I mean, need to, uh, then you have a, uh, have a deal with the mage to play Counter-Strike at 8. Oh, then you need to take down the web server so people can't use your web shop while you play Counter-Strike. And then you can get the web shop on, online afterwards after playing, playing Counter-Strike. No. Definitely recommend, unless you want to spend a lot of time knowing, reading up on how to run a server, probably have a spare computer for running the server. Find somewhere, uh, and so on. Do find somewhere, some company offering the services for you. Because they are doing all the hard work of running the server, including paying the power bills, including paying the power bills and so on. They're doing all the hard work of running the server for you. And usually, many of them aren't that costly. But of course, as with anything in life, the more money you pay, the better quality you get. And usually some of the cheap ones like Uno Euro, which is very popular. Let's just say what see what they cost. They do have the oh, let's change it to English just to be nice to most to the international one students here. Yeah. Well there's a reason they call call their name is Uno Euro after all. Their cheapest web portal is one euro per month. That gives you five gigabytes of data. You can actually have quite a lot of website on five gigabytes. And then you have tons of images or videos. Then, but then again, if you have videos, maybe consider would it be a good idea to use, like I said last time, use YouTube instead. So, for one euro, you get a website, get people to run your website for, get people running your website. That's pretty nice. Of course, they don't run the website website. They only run the server the website is on. So you you, you 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 do need yourself to update the website and. Make sure security and all that stuff is online, is uh, up to date. Otherwise, you might one day get a nasty email from them saying, we have taken your website offline because it was, it was sending out thousands of spam mails a second. That happens rather often. People hack websites to send those spam links. So you still need to manage your website, but at least you don't need to manage the server. And for a, few mo for a little money a month, that's definitely worth the hassle because otherwise you do end up spending quite a few hours every month uh, making sure your server run, runs securely. And I don't know about you, but my time is definitely worth more than one. Um, my hourly, what I have, my time is worth more than one euro an hour. So that's definitely, that's a good place to start. By only, by, to be honest, you won't get me saying the uh, you know, euro is a great host. They aren't. They've gotten better with the years, a lot better. But for one euro, yeah, considering the price, you're getting a great deal. That must, I must admit. They actually have daily backups nowadays. Another option is they have the option of having a one-click installation. So you basically just go to your control panel for your website away from them and say, install WordPress and they install it for you. You don't need to be, no, don't need to do all the stuff with entering database info and so on. A lot of people do that. I do remember, I do recommend uh, installing it the way I showed you. Prob install it properly because one click installs usually are often there are some few things compromises made somewhere. But as you can see, that's cheap. You even get the domain because having a domain. I mean, we all want a domain because something 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 dot euro euro dot ek. That doesn't sound very good, but Thomas Dog Shop. That sounds a lot better if you want if to go back to the if you want to sell stuff for dogs. I don't name Thomas. It would be a bit strange having a website named Thomas Dog Shop if you're named if you're named uh, uh, something else. But yeah, domains are nice. Usually they cost money. Might as well take this. But many web but many, when you're, usually when you're ordering a web portal the first time, 
you get the get you get the domain for free, at least a .dk domain if you're using a Danish host. The .dk domains .dk domain domains aren't that costly. You sh they usually you have to pay a bit more. Uh, normally, if you just buy the domain spare, you have to pay a bit money to upfront fifty to hundred krona, and then you get a new domain because most of those sorts of you can actually have more than one domain and have more than one website. So domains aren't costly. The, the only thing is, after the first year, you usually have to pay the domain separately. So you make a web post, and maybe after the first year, you might get you will probably you might get an uh, mail from a company. Well, they are a company, I suppose. A non-government organization, to be honest, to be correct, called DK Hostmaster, and then say you make you you have to pay us fifty krona to keep your to keep your domain. Is to keep owning your domain because that's what it costs 50 krona a year to have a DK domain. Usually, you get the first year for free from your web host at least. But then again, 50 krona a year to have a unique address that's not very much. That's not very much. And it does seem a lot more professional to have, I don't know, have your own domain. But usually, at least you get the first year for free. The DK is 50 krona, dot com is usually a bit more, and dot net and so on. If you, for some reason or the other, want a .xxx domain, they cost a lot of money to renew and keep, the, keep those in your name. But you can get those too. There's a lot of domains out there. If they aren't in use, that's a good thing about uh, DK Hostmaster. You can just go in and say, is the domain free? No, it's not. It's taken, and you can see who actually owns who actually owns it. So yeah, if you're very much worried about your personal information get on getting out online, then you might not should pay for pay for a fire domain because it is public who owns domain. It has to be. It's basically the same. If you own a house, people can go into public records and know and know who owns that address actually. It is a lot more professional, but you get those domains. When you, you buy a web portal, you usually get the choice, do you want to transfer a domain you already know, own, or do you want to buy a new domain? And those web posts also have the option, you just write whatever domain you name you want, and then they check, oh, then it checks for you, is it free? No, then you can't, you just can't buy it. If it is free, then you can buy it, and then it's yours, and as long as you pay the yearly fee to keep it alive. So you know, Euro is a good starting point, I say, very cheap. The same goes for run.com. It's also very cheap. Also, somewhat still somewhat mediocre. There's a lot of what going into many, many details, but it's easy to get started. And they do have a somewhere fair, somewhat fair price. You see, they're a slight bit costlier than uh, Uno Euro. You get a basic web host for, for 19 kroner per month. On the other hand, for 19 kroner, with Euro, Euro for the one euro, you got five gigabyte. Here you get twenty-five gigabyte for twenty-five krona. So that's for three times as much. You get five times the space. So it's again, it's a bit cheap. It's a slight bit costlier, but you do get a slight bit better service. And that's a general for web with web hosts. The more you pay, the more the better service you get. For those two, Euro, Euro and uh, One dot com, they are good places for starters. Again, Surftown slight bit costly again. At least it was. What did they take for their starter web hosting? Nowadays, they take uh, 29 krona a month. But again, I say that put them a slight bit better service wise too, and a slight bit better yeah, overall experience. But they do cost a slight bit more too. Actually, I had a quite nice. Uh, Talk with one of their supporters quite uh, 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 a little while ago because I was a bit critical of the services because I found historically that they weren't that great and then I had a, then I and then I talked about that online and then uh, one of the supporters said hey we've gone better and then I had a long talk about it and then convinced me to give them another chance so they actually they seem to have strained up and gotten quite gotten a bit more, quite a bit more serious and 
So that again, that's also a good, again, slight bit, slight few more money, but again, a slight bit better service. And then of course, if you want good service, then there are companies specializing in good service. Let's see, yeah, you see? Euro, euro, one dollar, one euro a month. Their cheapest one here, especially those I know that guy, 150 krona a month. That's a lot more. But again, the service level is also, it's also a lot higher. With some of the others, for example, with Yandex, One.com, and Euro, Euro, you arrive their support, and then you rave. You have, you can't really, you can't. At least on the cheaper options, you can't phone them. But on the hand, for one euro, what can you expect? You can't. Uh, telephone support where, where, where they would look at your problem right away with your server goes down. Ah, for one euro, that's expecting quite a lot. With those kind of price and those companies, yeah, of course, if you have a problem, phone the company, even if, to a certain extent, even in the middle of the night, and then they'll get to look, get to working on fixing your problem. So again, how much is your website worth? The more you, the more you value it, of course, the better, the better host you can afford, you want to afford for it. And those premium hosts, they do have a lot of premium things going for them, but they then get the prices so. And then, of course, another option would be, well, getting a company to, to manage, get a company, not only to host your website, but even maintain it. So then again, we are, again, we are moving into another target area economically, but on the other hand, for a company, your time, if your company needs to, to you spend your time doing, maintaining the website to make, to make sure it's up to date and secure and all that stuff, that's basically, well, that costs money for the company after all because you also need to get paid. Even if you're owner, then you're just spending your time maintaining the website instead of spending the time going out there and talk with customers. So if you're running a company, consider is it even worth many? If it, would it be worth it having a whole com having another company maintain your website, not only host it but even do all the stuff, do all the work on it? Of course, you can still post uh, new content to it and all that stuff. You do, that's not blocked. But all the maintaining and updating and making sure it's secure and so on and keeping on track of all that, keeping up on t keeping on keeping on top of all those options. Maybe that would be worth it for a company to pay for that service. Probably would. But for you yourself getting started and getting your website on, getting your website on and running, one of those hosts for somewhere below 50 krona a month would be a great place to start. Of course, but also put all these links online along with the with the stuff from today. And I basically think. That was, that was a very, very brief rundown of some of the hosts available here in Denmark. There are a lot more. Why should you use a web host in Denmark? Why not just find some cheap one in the US? A, the web hosts in the US aren't that much cheaper than those in Denmark, at least if you want at least some media, some media of being uh, stable and so on. Plus, at each web host, there's a good chance that the web server is somewhere in Denmark. If you choose some American web host or an international company, there's a good chance that the server will be in the US or somewhere else in the world. Why does that matter? I mean, it's the internet, everything's connected. Yeah. It is. But even though it's electricity and electric signals moving around, carrying data, all the data moving around is electric signals, there's still a lot shorter way to Denmark to, uh, let's say, Copenhagen, there's a, there's, a huge, there's a big data center in Copenhagen where a lot of companies use, uh, host the servers. There's a lot shorter way to Copenhagen than to San Francisco, even if you're talking about electricity and, web and, uh, and network communication. Plus, if you have to go all the way to San Francisco, there's a lot greater little risk of somewhere cable gets having been cut and then there's some problems underway and so on. So, yes, it does take longer to get a signal to San Francisco than it does to Copenhagen. That's natural. I mean, there's only, even even in cover there's a limit or glass fiber, there's a limit on how fast signals can move. And yes, your customers will feel it. 
just to Just get an example. Um, yeah, of course, not to check, but even checking your website, the yeah, tools to check that we can check from the different from around the world. Is your website it's placed in Copenhagen? You might have an access time of two seconds. You might have you might have a load time of one and a half two seconds. The same website when you try to access that from California, that would basically be let's say you move the server to California, it might be six seconds. And those six seconds, they mean a lot. For each second a website loads slower, you lose 20 to 40 percent of the area of the customers be said because they're going they're, they're going on. They don't want to people don't want to wait for a slow website. So it makes sense to place the server of your website closest to the target audience. And since we're in Denmark, it probably would be using a Danish hosting company. If you make a website that's mean which mean target is American, by all means find a hosting solution in the US because that will be close to your target audience. And that's why a lot of companies such as Facebook and Amazon and so on, they have, web, they have web, different web servers spread all over the world. So they, and then they, they it in such a way so it checks, oh, he's a customer from Denmark. Then we'd better go to the web server that says, and well, they're building they're a data center in there, in, uh, probably building a data center for the version. So they'll check, they'll get the file from that one instead of getting, getting, getting uh, loading the website from their web loading the website from the data center in California. So, as we're in Denmark, choose a Danish web host. One, for the speed, and two, because of security. If you're storing customer information, I talked a slight bit about the thing about uh, with the EU laws for next year. If you are, there's a, coming some, there are some strict rules already, and there are coming even more strict rules next year, about storing customer data. And the, you can't store very much customer data outside of Europe, given the year. You can, but it would be technically be uh, findable next year if you pay leave. That's why Facebook and all, that's the second reason that all of those big companies, Amazon, Facebook, and all of those are making data center centers in Europe. One of the, one is the, yeah, good. Geographical placement closer to the customers. The other one is you can, uh, because customer data stays as close to the customer as possible due to the regulations and so on. So if you're making something for Danes, host this stuff in Denmark. Yeah. That was uh, some brief suggestions on that. I think we've caught most of it. What domain to use for your website? Well, whatever you feel like. If it's a website targeted at Danish people, buy .dk. If it's international, it might be worth it paying that money, paying in that bit extra to get it .com because that's after all the international one, or usually actually used to be American, but it's more or less international nowadays, and so on. So find the domain type that fits whatever your target audience is again. And which one is the right one for you? Well, I can't say that. It's only you, it's you who know your target audience, not me. So, to finish this, I hope I've given you a few ideas about how important security is and a few pointers on where to host your website and how to move it there. And throughout the course, I hope you're given a small glimpse of some of the stuff you can do with WordPress, even without coding. And my main suggestion for you would be get out there, make a website, maybe buy a web host, a cheap one. I mean, ten, uh, around a euro a month or two, a euro a month, that's not much. Get, get out there, get making, get playing. That's how you learn stuff. Make a website, play with it, break it, find out how you broke it, fix it, and get, and get it up and running again. Because websites are a great way to engage people. It's a great way for you to get your views and get your maybe get your products or get your views if you're running a personal blog. Get get your stuff out there. So get working. Thank you.